Are these the worst therapists in the world? Well, I don't know. I've had my share of stories that I've heard about bad counselors, bad therapists, and just saying some irresponsible things. BuzzFeed has compiled a list of some of the horrible things that therapists have said to clients, and those clients have shared that with BuzzFeed. So let's go down the list, check out what some of these therapists might have been thinking when they said these things. Let's jump right into it. Okay, so the first one I'm looking at here, BB Von Pinkbuns says, when I was a teenager and dealing with trauma from my childhood, I was very angry and very clearly needed help. A therapist told my parents right in front of me that I was too bitter and hostile to be helped. Thank goodness my parents never took me back to him. I'm a lot better off now. Okay, that's an interesting one. So the therapist says right in front of the parents, in front of the kid too, I'm assuming it was a kid at the time, that they were too angry, too bitter to be helped. There's a possibility that that therapist or that counselor felt like they were out of their depth. That I would probably prefer to have in a private conversation with the parents and probably phrasing it in a way that's not like, oh, they're beyond help, but maybe. As a therapist, I feel like I'm practicing beyond my scope or I don't have the competency to deal with the number of issues that are going on here and perhaps you would be better served by seeing someone who maybe specializes in anger management or dealing with you know whatever traumas may have been going on or that bitterness instead of just saying oh they're too angry nobody can help them I think that's the impression that was wrongly given in that situation so definitely I, I want to give the therapist or the counselor the benefit of the doubt there but their delivery needs to be cleaned up a lot more this one's shared anonymously during the pandemic we were obviously meeting via zoom she thought the call had ended and heard her say Jesus Christ she's effing exhausting I immediately texted her to call her out. Oh. She started and stopped typing a few times before asking to speak to me after she finished with the rest of her appointments. I had really liked her, so I was torn. I told her I would reach out when I was ready, but I wasn't able to get past it, and my therapy came to an abrupt end. It was already hard opening up to someone. After that, I was completely soured. Yeah, I get it. To hear your therapist talking about how exhausting it is to talk with you, that's gotta be really discouraging to hear. Um, not to mention whatever shame and feelings of guilt might be piled on top of that. I get why this person didn't go back to that therapist. It would be really hard to get that out of your head every time you were sharing about something and because now the dynamic of the relationship has changed. Now you as a client would be thinking, Am I bugging them? Am I being too exhausting for them? And the session has now become about the therapist. On the counselor slash therapist side of things, it's okay to feel exhausted by a client. It's okay to feel frustrated by a client. I would hit mute or I would make sure I was hung up before I said anything about that. But if you're really having that much difficulty that you couldn't contain that for another second to make sure that you were really logged off, that probably bears some consultation talking with a peer or a supervisor to say like, hey, there's something going on where this client is particularly frustrating or tiring for me to work with and to be able to work that through so that doesn't bleed over into your practice and working with them. I think there's this misperception among counselors and among just the general population that therapists cannot dislike anybody. And that's not the case. We all have our personal biases and our own hangups with particular things. All that means is that we have to search within ourselves to find out, okay, what's going to trip me up? What's going to be especially tiring for me? What's gonna be especially frustrating for me to work with? And then if a client is showing some of that, it's not that you turn them away, but you just be on guard to say like, okay, I recognize this is one of the things that might trip me up. So let me be careful. Let me be very intentional about how I talk about those things and make sure that I don't put my values on the client. All right, I was telling my therapist about the reason behind my parents' divorce, which was very scarring for me and I never told anyone about it before. And she said, unfortunately, our session is coming to an end, but I wanna book you in for another as soon as possible because this is a very entertaining story. Oh, I'm glad she found my suffering entertaining. Yeah, lots of problems with this one. Again, you see that dynamic. The dynamic has shifted from being about the client and their suffering and their pain to now somehow it's about the counselor's entertainment 
definitely a problem there. And of course, I know like with counselors and therapists, we have to manage our time properly. We might have a client waiting in the waiting room already, and maybe there just is too much to unpack in that moment. But I do feel like there's a better way to say like, hey, this seems very important to you. We don't have the time to dedicate to that right now. Let's book another session as soon as possible because this seems to be on your mind. This seems to be bothering you. And let's make sure that we can dedicate the time that this really deserves to be able to unpack that. Not, oh man, like this is a cliffhanger. I can't wait to see the next episode. So I'll make sure I have you in as soon as possible so you can finish up your story. Again, yeah, when we enter that room, there are gonna be some clients who have fascinating stories to tell. And I do think that's one of the things I do enjoy about providing therapy is that I get to hear about people's experiences and their stories. What we have to be aware of though, of course, is that it's not for our entertainment. We are there for them. We are there for the clients. We are here to hear your stories so that we can be a help and a support for you. It's not about us being entertained by that. That is totally an unnecessary way to be framing that. TSC says, I was 14 years old and it was the first time I had ever seen a therapist. I told her about my brother's suicide and she told me that suicide is just a slap in God's face. Well, first of all, whoever this person is, I'm sorry that you had to deal with your brother's suicide at the age of 14. Definitely, that is not the thing to lead with as a counselor to just put your sense of morality out there and say, suicide is wrong. Your brother was disrespecting God. Totally inappropriate for the counselor or therapist to say that. And one of the reasons is that, again, this becomes about the counselor. This is their sense of morality. This is their sense of right and wrong. Suicide is wrong. And I'm going to let this client know that. Never mind that this was their brother who they obviously cared about and they're hurting because of what recently happened with their brother, but now you're piling on top of that and saying like, oh, your brother did something wrong. Again, this isn't to say that counselors can't have a sense of morals, a sense of right and wrong. You may very well feel that suicide is wrong, and that is completely within your freedom to do that, to believe that as an individual. Once you step into that counseling room and you are somebody's counselor, then you suspend your sense of judgment about uh, what you're doing is wrong, or what this person is doing is wrong, to be able to provide that unconditional positive regard, to be able to hear their story, where they're coming from, what their sense of right and wrong is, and their values, and how their experiences line up with that. So yeah, totally off base for a counselor to put that sense of right and wrong, especially on a teenager, totally uncalled for. All right, BCGT5922. My mom had me go to therapy when I was 12 after my dad passed, and I was in the room when it happened. Wow, first of all, okay, traumatic, okay, first of all, traumatic experience. I was a really shy kid and didn't want to go, let alone open up to a stranger about an ordeal I didn't even fully understand yet. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people would jump straight to counseling, which is potentially a good idea, but yeah. There's still a lot of processing internally going on, especially for a 12 year old who may have had no experience with death or someone close to them dying yet. And then to witness it, there's a lot that they're sorting through. Their whole world has been rearranged. After I was not giving him a whole lot in the way of answers, he asked me, do you even miss your dad? Ooh, maybe examine your way of talking to a grieving child before blaming said child a-hole. Yeah. I get the sense of anger there and that sense of frustration like, wow, my whole world is just turned upside down and you don't have the patience to sit with me in silence while I sort through like, would I even feel comfortable sharing to a stranger who just walked into my life and is asking me about one of the most personal things that has ever happened to me? I get why this therapist or counselor may have felt impatient. I feel more comfortable working with adults and having conversations with adults. And again, that's my personal preference. I do my best to examine that whenever I am working with kids versus working with adults and try to make sure that that bias or that preference doesn't get in the way of me providing the best work that I can for whoever's in front of me. But when it comes down to it though, when you're working with adolescents or kids, they're still developing that emotional language. They're developing ideas and senses of values that aren't easy to communicate. 
maybe they don't have much language or much category to be thinking about these things and to be confronted with something as serious as death at 12 years old sometimes we don't even have a category for that at that point so yeah absolutely i do think that maybe that therapist or counselor let their impatience get in the way of that and maybe they were trying to provoke some kind of response but i could definitely see how that totally backfired especially when you're talking about grief that looks so different from person to person there's not just like one linear path that everyone goes through that you just got to move them through the checkpoints but it'll bounce around there'll be uh, times when you feel closer to that person or farther away from that person you'll feel like it hurts more or hurts less and it's not just that linear progression that we would hope that it would be but at that point it's really the job of the counselor to be able to sit with that discomfort to be like okay yeah this is a difficult conversation for you and i feel that and i'm okay with sitting with that discomfort this counselor or therapist seemed to be speaking out of their discomfort and their impatience and that's what really damaged the relationship there all right last one here a therapist said to me i don't think you're doing badly enough to test you for anxiety I was miserable, constantly stressed, and having complete breakdowns at least twice a week, and she completely invalidated that after talking to me for five minutes. After I went straight to a doctor to get diagnosed, the therapist pretty much just said, oops. She got fired from the college shortly after because a lot of students had various issues with her. I can see why. So a couple of things going on here. I do get that in a college setting, a lot of those therapists and counselors are overworked and have a huge caseload of a lot of students to manage so the ratio is huge and i can see why maybe that therapist within the first five minutes was trying to come to a determination and that is a problem with the medical model because it is very diagnosis based and if certain symptoms don't meet a certain criteria then you just cannot make that diagnosis but the bottom line for diagnosing is that there is some significant impact on their functioning and their behavior and if you're talking about having breakdowns, constantly being stressed, I don't see how that's not enough to test for anxiety. Regardless of whether that person was able to test for anxiety or not, or whether they would have met criteria for some kind of anxiety disorder, the big keyword here is invalidated. After five minutes, you really have a chance to make or break that therapeutic rapport. And this counselor really seemed like they just tore that down. That feeling of invalidation pretty much wrecked any opportunity for them to have some kind of productive conversation, productive working relationship together. And that's what it is. Somebody might come in thinking, I have these diagnoses or, oh, I'm definitely this, or I'm definitely struggling with this. I might not agree with that. And that's perfectly fine. And that's perfectly fine. Again, I can have my personal beliefs. I can have my professional opinion. But again, that there's a level of respect that I can still listen to. Okay, well, what makes you think that you're struggling with anxiety? What's been going on over the past couple of months? What patterns have you noticed? What other symptoms may be going on that maybe we haven't considered? How is it impacting your life? To at least hear that story and say, okay, I can see why you would think that anxiety is the issue here. If I have a difference of opinion, have you considered this? When I am having that conversation about diagnosis with my clients, I always ask them, hey, this is how I am conceptualizing what's going on in your life but you are obviously living in it you're the in the middle of it and that's every day for you do you feel like this description of the symptoms which is what a diagnosis is this description of your collection of symptoms do you feel like that sums up your situation fairly or is there a better way to capture what's going on I do always try to make it clear to them that a diagnosis can evolve as we see symptoms change, as we see circumstances change, and as we see coping change. That can also change what that diagnosis is. It's not written in stone. And I do need all my clients to know that because that'll impact how we work together, what we're focusing on, and what we're going after in terms of treatment goals and steps towards getting better. Wow, these were not easy to read. I'm definitely concerned about the counselors and therapists that may have said these things. I do hope that whoever shared some of those stories were able to get help that they felt matched what they needed in the end. But that's the importance of doing ethics right. Professional counseling associations have ethical codes. State licensing boards have ethical rules that we have to abide by and 
that helps to prevent a lot of situations like these from happening. If you enjoyed this video, please give a like and subscribe. That helps our channel to keep growing as we continue tackling difficult mental health topics. As always, take care of yourself, take care of the others around you. See you next time.